Oh, hello YouTube! Greetings from Elysia Eyebrow, 21st for this channel, and it's quite unusual. We're not reviewing a Transformer, we're not even reviewing an action figure, but we are, depending on your definitions, reviewing a toy. And I mean that with the utmost respect. This is the review for the Ender 5 S1, which was graciously sent in by Creality themselves for this sponsored review. This might be an interesting take on the Ender 5, as I'm by no means an expert in the field of 3D printing, I just enjoy doing it. Before this, all I've had to use was the Ender 3 machine, again from Creality, and that's certainly seen its track miles. I mean, everything I've sold on my website has either been printed on this machine or on the resin printer if it needed the higher detail, and the Ender 3 providing stuff like tires, or basically structural and color stuff. That being said, the Ender 3 is kind of what most people think of when they think of a 3D printer and that you have a print head that moves back and forth in the X direction, and a bed that moves back and forth in the Y direction. And for good reason. This type of printer, known as Cartesian printers, are some of the more budget-friendly options, and for what they offer, they're great to get you going. However, viewers that may already have, say, the Ender 3, like this one used to be, may notice a boatload of modifications, such as a new motherboard with better drivers, a direct drive conversion, support struts to ensure squareness, dual Z-height motor conversion, spring mods, 3-point Y carriage, upgrades that you have to print out yourself for cable management, among other things. And that doesn't even get into what you could install, like a BL Touch, a magnetic bed, or a better cooling system. Long story short, for a printer that only cost me $300, I've easily put in an additional $200 and literal hours of my time to calibrate and really bring up to a really good standard. However, not everyone has the time and know-how to do these sorts of things, and sometimes it's nice to just pay that all at once and get something that's designed to work with all of its parts from the get-go. Enter the Ender 5 S1. The Ender 5 S1 is definitely pricier than its hobbyist level Ender 3 sibling, but that cost translates into a Core XY machine that just works right out of the gate with your standard tuning procedure. Construction of the machine was an absolute breeze. The base of the machine comes pre-assembled with power supply and display interface built in as a solid unit. Profiles bolt into four corners with colored stickers indicating what goes where. The upper carriage assembly comes pre-assembled and bolts onto the top of the profiles. The bed needs attached to the Z-height assembly with four clamp style brackets and then just mounts inside with a few bolts. And like, that's it. No having to fiddle around with belts, the machine went together square unlike my Ender 3 which needed these support rods to get it to that point. Just plug in a few wires and you're off to the races with a machine that is fairly well self-contained. Like, not to keep ragging on what the Ender 3 isn't, but with that machine you have to keep a healthy amount of space in front and behind of the build plate as that's a moving part. Whereas the Ender 5, you just set it and forget it, and so long as nothing is intruding within the confines of the profile cage, you're good to run. And man, this thing is just so clean! I was very impressed by how it looked mechanically, and then when I actually got to the cable management part, I was just blown away. Like, built into the design are all these channels and clips included to keep the cables running along the frame of the machine, and it just makes for such a clean, finished look, which is something you just don't get with the Ender 3. In fact, it's highly recommended you print off cable chains for the sake of cable longevity, never mind a clean form factor, and the Ender 5 just gets it. So the Ender 5 is built. Let's talk about some of its features. The Ender 5 comes with a touchscreen interface running Creality's build of Marwin firmware. I didn't really use it, but we'll talk about that later. Hardware interfaces include full-size SD card support, which you have no idea how grateful I am that it's that and not micro SD, and a USB-C port. Starting from the filament spool and working our way to the bed, it includes a filament sensor that will halt the machine if it stops detecting filament, which is a safety feature to stop you from ruining your hot end. A Bowden tube connects this sensor all the way up and over to the dual gear direct drive extruder mounted on top of a proprietary hodden with a very complicated construction with some of the craziest looking heat dispersion fins I have seen on this type of setup. But hey, it works. Looks like it disperses a lot more heat with the amount of surface area it's utilizing in such an enclosed space. Speaking of cooling though, on the back of the hot end is a 5015 blower fan that's being split and channeled to either side of the hot end for really efficient part cooling. Parts of which are adhering themselves to a magnetic bed, no more fumbling around clips that I'm not careful could collide with the hot end, and all of that being monitored by a Z-height switch for active bed mesh calibrations. Like, this machine has it all. It's got direct drive, with proper channeling to make sure like stuff like TPU does not wiggle all over the place, proper cooling, magnetic beds, a modified Y-axis motor providing dual belt drive support to the Y-axis, and my favorite addition of all, handles! I can carry this thing like no tomorrow! They thought of everything! 
Seriously though, even the bed itself. Since the original Ender 5, they've included longer slide bearings with a more stable carriage to give you the most stable platform they can. Like, there is just so much about this machine that I love. Not everything though. For instance, despite the mainboard having really decent drivers, they still make some noise, a little bit more than I was even expecting though. Like for a sound comparison, here's the 5 and the 3 printing at the same time. To be fair, the Ender 3 has had its board swapped with a board from an Ender 3 Pro with its silent TMC2225 drivers, so while the noise from the 5 isn't ideal, it's still a far cry from the dot magic printer-like noises the stock Ender 3 was making. All of that is just great and all, but the real question is, how does it print? Well, after a few minutes of just running through a bed leveling process and just using Kira's default profile for the Ender 5, I'm happy to say the prints came out pretty good, and faster at that, with the Ender 3's benchy completing in an hour and 52, and the Ender 5's benchy completing in an hour and 33. Obviously there's room for improvement with a few tweaks here and there to get rid of that seam for instance, but hey, fresh out of the box with no actual tuning? This is fantastic! So let's talk about that tuning, because this is the one and only time this new printer was running its stock firmware. Enter the Sonic Pad from Creality, which they also graciously provided for this video. This one did take me several hours to figure out, as this was all entirely new to me, however the time it saves in the long run was well worth the learning curve. The oversimplified explanation for this device is that it's a tablet that's designed to control your printer, but it does way more than just that. So first off, the Sonic Pad has five interface ports, four of which are USB, and one of those USB ports is designed to integrate with a webcam. What this means is that this device, when configured properly, can control up to four of your printers at the same time, or three of them with one of them having a time-lapse function if you like to film your prints, of which is compatible with most major webcam brands. Next, this device no longer uses Marlin, but rather it runs Clipper. The benefit of this is that a lot of the firmware is now streamlined so that tuning the machine is so much easier, for better and faster prints, and doing so is fairly simple. For those that have their own and wish to set theirs up, I followed Ricky Impey's playlist for getting this up and running and it's been an invaluable playlist. Highly recommend you check him out if you need to get going. Anyway, the setup consists of telling the Sonic Pad what Wi-Fi to connect to, telling the machine what USB port your machine is on, and then telling it what machine you have. For the Ender 5, this was pretty straightforward, but I MUST stress, the S1 that I got didn't have a Z-Limit switch, but instead had the Z-Sensor installed, and I didn't understand this when I selected the machine on the Sonic Pad, and the Z-Sensor missed the bed entirely on its first bed mesh calibrate and threw the machine way out of whack. So, you know, keep that in mind at all if you have an S1 and a Sonic Pad and you're trying to get this going. If you have the sensor, you don't have a Z-Switch. Keep that in mind. Anyway, the Ender 3 was a bit of an adventure getting set up and that the machine was nowhere near stock, but I found an approximation and got that machine set up too. So once the machines were set up and all the bed leveling, PID tuning, and other typical calibrations on new machines was complete, came the other thing the Sonic Pad is really great for. And that's acceleration tuning, or input shaping as this thing puts it. The Sonic Pad comes with its own dedicated accelerometer sensor. You're then told to print off a series of adapters or find some way to bolt the sensor to the parts you need. In the Ender 5's case, a single adapter is sufficient, but for the Ender 3, a part that you print to the bed and leave, in addition to an extruder head adapter, is required. In any case, the Sonic Pad begins oscillating the moving parts at increasing speeds while monitoring the vibrations until it tunes itself to the proper acceleration settings. What this means is that once the Sonic Pad has all this data set, you can then increase the speed of the prints while still retaining a level of quality not easily attainable by the average user. I mean, before this, you had to print a dedicated XY part and run a specific test and play with the values until you got it just right, and here it's just print an adapter, hit a button, you're done. It really helps streamline the process for the average user. Finally, another great feature that I found I really benefited from, and that was its wireless connectivity. Installing a service called Moonraker into Kira, and then configuring the IP address of the Sonic Pad, I was able to configure the setup so that once I'm done a design, I can upload it directly to the Sonic Pad from the slicer, and then open up Clipper Web UI and start the print from the comfort of my own desk. No having to fumble around with SD cards, walk back and forth, etc, etc. And as an added bonus, I can actually take one exported G code and feed it to both printers. This made it possible with Clipper's macro system in which I tell Kira that the start and end G code is a macro called start and end print, and each machine will then carry out what it needs to do with each setup and then get into the print. 
I have both machines tuned to a point that the final results are pretty close to identical, so running the machines this way has been pretty convenient. So I've been singing the praises of Clipper for the last little bit. Has it been perfect? No. No, it hasn't. For those in my audience that are older than the age of 30, I compare the jump to Clipper from Marlin much like the time you were working at retail as a teenager and all the POS terminals updated from a DOS-based architecture to a modern Windows 7-based one. Sure, it's better. Like, there's so many features that make it so I'm not about to run back to Marlin, and yet there's little things that bug me. For instance, in the web UI, whenever I start a print, I can't adjust the temperatures until it hits what it's told to do, meaning I can't preheat the hot end until the bed finishes, even if I tell it to do so. I'm sure there was a way to fix this with a macro or something, I just hadn't figured it out a week into working with it. If a print fails in a way that the machine ends up halting itself, or I manually cancel a print or something, getting the machine to clear out the print has been a painful experience involving firmware restarts, power downs, and even then I may not get the results I'm looking for. In other words, Clipper seems to want to resume the print halfway through no matter what I try, and when I notice it's trying to do that, again, I can't tell the printer to stop doing what it's told until the bed and the hot end finish what they were told to do. Even in this example, I realized I selected the wrong file, told the machine to cancel, and it just did whatever the code vomit was, despite actually hitting the temperature it was told to do. Once the file actually does get cleared out though, it's fine and works as intended, it's just basically, you need to finish your prints or you're going to be wrestling with Clipper for the next 10-15 to 15 minutes. Those are just two issues with the UI anyway. The possibility exists I'm just doing things in the wrong order, for instance the later problem I found is negated by cancelling on the Sonic pad versus in the web UI, but that's the experience I had regardless. Anyway, what's all that tuning got me? Much better prints at two times the speed, which is great when you're trying to run a 3D printed part business. These benches after tuning now complete in an hour and look just as great. Pushing them further starts to see diminishing returns though as the bench is completed in 42, but at a base speed of 120 millimeters a second, I don't want to stress out the motors, but hey, that options exist if you're really in a hurry and you're just trying to test print a design. I do like now that I'm able to run both machines from one centralized location, which has allowed me to completely remove the user interface from the three and simplify the look of that machine, and the ability to tune out a lot of what was wrong on the three before I got the Sonic Pad without having to spend tens of hours figuring everything out was highly appreciated. So in short, I really do like the Ender 5 S1. During the livestream build of this machine, someone asked in the comments about which one to get, and here's basically my recommendation. If you're on a tight budget, the Ender 3 is a great machine for the price. It will get you adequate prints. However, over time, you will more than likely want to upgrade something here or there to improve the quality of your prints, as well as the ease of dealing with the printer itself. And if you go that route, you're going to eventually start hitting a price point where you will have spent as much as just buying the Ender 5 outright. Like, I was deeply impressed with just how many features it had straight out of the gate. A filament sensor, a Z-height sensor for bed mesh, direct drive, the magnetic bed, dual belt Y carriage, and more. All things that I either had to buy for the 3 or still have yet to buy, and it's just all here for the 5, making fantastic prints just after one bed level. And the Sonic print, after getting used to its UI, has been absolutely wonderful too. Tuning the machine has never been easier, and the added speed without sacrificing quality has been super nice. So again, thanks to Creality for sponsoring this review. The next review we're going to get back into stop motion and use the Ender 5 to turn an off-brand Ferrari into a really off-brand Lamborghini. This has been the Lazy Eyebrow.